All right, welcome back. So today we're going to talk about the T distribution. Right? In some ways, this is a alternative to the Z distribution when we're dealing with inference techniques about the population mean. So let's just kind of think about where we're where we're coming from. We're working towards this idea of statistical inference, right? Point estimation, confidence intervals, hypothesis test. This is these are the methods that we're going to be looking at and we're going to be working down this list. Right? We're starting at the top here using x bar to estimate mu. Right? Now remember what we saw before. Pretty much everything we were we were talking about before, right? We when we used x bar to estimate mu, we assumed we knew sigma. Right? But maybe maybe some of you guys were thinking there's there's kind of an issue with that. Right, so, so what's the issue? Well, we usually don't know in practice things about the population that we're sampling from. We may have a general idea, but we usually don't know, especially exact numbers and exact values of parameters. Right? Also, in this case, another sort of logical contradiction here right, is, remember, sigma is the population standard deviation mu is the population mean. Okay, so so what we're thinking here, we're trying to use x bar to estimate mu, right? That's our goal. And in the process, assuming we know sigma. But if I don't know mu, I'm using x bar to estimate it. If I don't know mu, remember we need mu to calculate sigma in the first place. So if I don't know mu, how would I know sigma? But the assumptions that we were under earlier were saying, okay, well, let's suppose we know sigma in order to estimate mu. All right, so there's there's kind of some logical fallacies going on there. All right, so most of the time in practice, we don't actually know sigma. Okay, so what do we do if we don't know sigma? Well, we can estimate it. All right, so what should we estimate sigma with? Well, we know x bar, right, the sample mean is a good estimate of mu. So if our sample mean is a good estimation of our population mean, well then, what should be a good estimate of our population standard deviation? about s, our sample standard deviation. Okay, that should make should make some sense there. Get rid of all this. Alright, now so we kind of showed a little bit about the sampling distribution of x bar trying to estimate mu. We showed it's precise, we showed it's accurate, it's a good estimate. Now for s and sigma though, you'll just kind of have to take my word for it. S s is an unbiased estimator of sigma, right? So let's review these formulas. Okay, we know how to calculate population standard deviation. We know how to calculate sigma. We know how to calculate s. So what were the big differences here in these two in these two formulas? Same idea, right? take each value, subtract the mean, square it, add them all up, divide by how many we have. Right? But remember the big difference. Population standard deviation we're dividing by n. Sample standard deviation, you would think we would divide by little n, right? but we're actually dividing by n minus 1. Right? So that quantity, that value n minus 1, keeps s as an unbiased estimate of mu dividing by n minus 1. Now we'll we'll follow up on this a little bit later right? but it it keeps it unbiased and that quantity n minus 1 is going to be important to us. That quantity n minus 1 is what we call our degrees of freedom. Okay so we'll use our degrees of freedom in what we're going to be talking about today with our t distribution. All right, so when we don't know sigma, we still need good sampling techniques. Right? And we would like our population to be normally distributed. We may not know for sure, 
but at the very least we, we want to see it fairly symmetric we don't want to see skewness we don't want to see extreme outlining right? but since we're introducing more variability right we're not just estimating mu with x bar right now we're estimating sigma with s in the process of trying to estimate mu with x bar and we're introducing another level of variability so we need a new distribution and that's where our t distribution comes in All right we're usually using t when we don't know sigma and we have smaller sample sizes All right the t is a it's actually a family of distributions that depends on this quantity n minus one so the t curve the t distribution changes right, based on our sample size based on your degrees of freedom okay so we're gonna look at the t and the z distribution side by side and at first glance you might not see too big of a difference right, but let's look at kind of some of the similarities first because like I said you may not see much of a difference right they both seem to be about the same shape right that kind of unimodal bell-shaped curve they both seem to be symmetric and specifically symmetric around zero right but what's different so if you'll notice the t distribution we have a little more area here out in our tails right so we know based on the empirical rule what's going on out here with the z distribution looks like the t we have a little more area and, and since it's more spread out the standard deviation right, is bigger We've got more areas in the tails so in other words there's more variability built in to our t distribution right we already kinda hit on that idea right the the z is very the t is very similar to the z right but with a little bit more variability built in Okay, so again, here's your z centered at zero, here's your t centered at zero. Overlaying the two. Now just take a minute to think which, what color here is the normal, what color is the z, what color is the t. That's right, the red is the normal, the blue is the t. All right, now I mentioned that the t distribution changes based on degrees of freedom. So actually this t distribution curve that we've been looking at is a, a t distribution with five degrees of freedom. Okay, so here's the t distribution with five degrees of freedom, 10 degrees of freedom, 15, 20, 30. All right, let's, let's do that again. Five, 10, 15, 20, 30. All right, see what's happening to the t? So here's some different colored t distributions. All right, so as we're moving from 5 to 10 to 30, black to blue to the green curve, what's happening there? Looks like it's getting a little taller, getting a little skinnier. Let's overlay the normal curve. All right, now this red curve is the normal. And we see once we hit 30, right, that green and that red, there's not a big, not a big difference between the green and the red curve. All right, so let's kind of sum all that up. T has more area in the tails. Right? And what we also saw was as our sample size gets bigger, as degrees of freedom gets bigger, it becomes more and more like that Z distribution. It makes sense. We've already saw with our central limit theorem that once we kind of hit that magic number of about 30, things tend to look normal. Okay? So... Let's think about, let's kind of sum all this up. All right, well, our t distribution, so we're using it when we usually don't know sigma right, for smaller sample sizes, but we also technically want to see that the population we're sampling from is, is about normal, is approximately normal. All right, so what we want to do, we want to make sure, okay, I don't see skewness in my histogram. I don't see outliers in my box plot and we know that a, a tool that we've seen before that will show us all of this stuff is a, a QQ plot or a normal probability plot okay so I could look at both of these separately or I could just make one of these get everything I need in my normal plot all right. so that's what we so these are the assumptions that we need to check all right. 
but technically, once our sample gets bigger, we don't have to be as strict on assumptions, right? For a really small sample, you know, five, six observations, if I had an outlier, right, I probably wouldn't want to use T, right? But, you know, as I start getting bigger, and, and, and what do we mean by a big sample versus small sample? Well, it's kind of arbitrary, but 30 is usually a pretty good, pretty good rule of thumb to use there. All right, so if I have, if my n is, say, sample size of 28, and I have an outlier, right, that outlier isn't going to be as big of a deal. Okay, so that's kind of what we mean by assumptions can be eased with larger samples. Okay, so let's sum everything up. So what we've seen before, when we know sigma, we can use z. Right, we can assume normality. If the population we're sampling from is normal, right, when the population is normal, any sample size we're good to go. When we don't have information about the population, if n's 30, we're good to go. All right, but remember before, we kind of had, we were going under the assumption that we know sigma, but if we had a small sample, right, we didn't really know where to turn there. We kind of hit a wall, right? But now, if we hit that wall, we have an alternative. Or if we don't know sigma, we have an alternative. We can use the T distribution, right? And here's our assumption we have to meet. No skewness, no outliers. Flexible with assumptions. And really, we can be flex so flexible that once our n's big enough, right, we can usually just assume our central limit theorem holds. All right, so thanks for tuning in. We'll look at some examples of this later.